In our next lesson on enzyme kinetics and inhibition, we want to look at catalytic efficiency in the Lineweaver-Burke equation. Recall from our last lesson that we actually had two measures for catalytic efficiency. First of all, Km was a measure of how well the enzyme bound its substrate, and we saw quite a difference. Lysozyme had a much higher affinity for its substrate than carbonic anhydrase for its. But we saw another, another measure, and that was the Vmax. How rapidly does the enzyme convert substrates to products? In that case, carbonic anhydrase was much faster than lysozyme. And so what we need is an expression that reflects both of these properties, and that is Kcat over Km. Remember, Kcat is directly proportional to Vmax. As Kcat increases, or as Km decreases, the efficiency of our enzyme increases. And this is just what we expect. The faster it makes product, or the more tightly it binds its substrate, it becomes more efficient. So now let's compare our two enzymes. Well, in the case of carbonic anhydrase, it's still three orders of magnitude better, more efficient, than lysozyme. But let's consider their functions. Remember carbonic anhydrase, its role is to convert CO2 to bicarbonate or vice versa. Well, there's certainly no limit to the concentration of CO2 or bicarbonate. There's an abundance of substrate. So we really don't need a low Km for that. On the other hand, we need it to work very quickly, and that it does very well. So it's perfectly suited to its function. Here we have lysozyme. Its role is to lyse the bacterial cell wall. This is our way of protecting ourselves against bacterial invaders. In that case, we don't necessarily need for it to work fast, but we certainly need for it to bind its target very tightly. In other words, even if there's a small amount present, I want lysozyme to bind its target and do its job. So again, it's perfectly suited to its function. So the kinetic constants perfectly match their function in the cell. So what are the factors that might influence catalytic efficiency? Well, some is just the rate of the electronic rearrangements that are needed to make the product. In other words, just the chemistry involved. But there's also a factor of how often the enzyme collides successfully with its substrate. In other words, we have proximity and orientation features. This is called the diffusion controlled limit. So the cell has a certain dimension, there are certain components present in the cell, and so there's a limit as far as how often that enzyme will actually meet its substrate, even regardless of substrate concentration. So we refer to an enzyme as having achieved catalytic perfection if the only thing controlling its rate is that diffusion controlled limit. In other words, not only is it faster than other enzymes, it's the fastest. No enzyme goes fastest, faster. It catalyzes the reaction as rapidly as it encounters the substrate. And I think our carbonic anhydrase enzyme would certainly fall into that category of being catalytically perfect. Now we want to develop a way to more accurately determine Km and Vmax. We saw we could estimate that from the graph, but that's not very accurate. And so Hans Lineweaver and Dean Burke in 1934 published an article where they simply rearranged the Michaelis-Menten equation, and that's illustrated at the bottom of the screen here. This is called the Lineweaver-Burke equation. They simply took the inverse of both sides of that equation and rearranged it. This is called the double reciprocal of the Michaelis-Menten equation. And as you can see, it's simply the equation for a line. So if we plot 1 over V0 versus 1 over substrate concentration, our slope will be Km over Vmax, and our y-intercept will be 1 over Vmax. Let's see what that looks like. So here's our Lineweaver-Burke plot. We've plotted 1 over V0 versus 1 over substrate concentration, and we have a straight line. So now we can do a line of best fit, and so we can fit all of our data points in a very accurate way. From this graph, then, from our slope, we get Km over Vmax. Our y-intercept is going to be 1 over Vmax, and our x-intercept is negative 1 over Km.
So now we have a more accurate way of determining this. We simply plot our points, do a line of best fit. The y-intercept for that equation will simply be the inverse of v-max. We find our x-intercept, take the negative inverse, and now we have km. You could also determine km from the slope, but you have to do another mathematical manipulation, and so it's a little bit more accurate to simply determine it from the x-intercept. But although that represents a far more accurate way of determining km and vmax than simply estimating them from the hyperbolic plot, it still isn't the most accurate way. And so what we have illustrated here is the same plot we saw before, but now we have the data points. And what we find is that the data points aren't evenly distributed. That's because we're taking the inverse of the substrate concentration, and when we prepare those concentrations, they're generally going to be multiples of one another. In other words, one half substrate, substrate concentration, 2x, 3x, and so forth. And so we find that at our upper point here, our last point on the line, much depends on the position of that data point. If we shift that data point ever so slightly, up or down, it's going to shift our curve. That will change the slope, the y-intercept, and the x-intercept. And so now uh, there is a great deal that depends on the accuracy of that one point. As it turns out, since we're talking about the uh, inverse substrate concentration, that point represents our lowest substrate concentration and therefore our most inaccurate point. The substrate concentration is so low and the product we get is so low that it's the least accurate number. So it really isn't the most accurate way. The best way is to use a computer program, fit the data to a hyperbola, and then we can get standard errors and get a better uh, measure of KM and Vmax and uh, our margin of error. In our next lesson, we'll see that not all enzymes obey Michaelis Minton kinetics. Remember, we made some simplifying assumptions, and so we want to look at those cases that do not obey Michaelis Minton kinetics and see how they differ from those that do.